I'm Deepak. I do security at uh, Rivos. And today we're going to talk about control flow integrity on Risk V. Um, this is what I've been doing for almost one year. And there are a bunch of people working on this stuff. So basically, I'm kind of representing everyone's work. Um, yeah. So we will talk about the basic problem statement and then uh, the path we are taking for enabling, and then we can take questions. I'll try to run through them as quickly as possible. Uh, memory safety is one of the major issues for C, C++ code base, and they are vulnerable to uh, corruption. And I have provided the links to that uh, from notable researchers on the topic. And one of the major implications of memory safety issues is that uh, uh, you have your function pointers or virtual, virtual function pointer table and read write memory as well as your return addresses on the stack, which is read write memory. And if you have a memory corruption in hands of an attacker, they can corrupt those uh, addresses and then take control of the uh, program. Um, most of the other architectures have similar uh, uh, primitives, which allows to uh, protect these control flows. And uh, on RISC-V, we, uh, we started with ZI, CFI, uh, name, but then we have split it to two different extensions now. So one of them is uh, ZICFILP, stands for uh, Control Flow Integrity Landing uh, Landing Pad. It protects the forward control flow. Uh, what it does is what it uh, does is that it enforces all the indirect branches must land on a landing pad instruction. Otherwise, uh, uh, CPU is is going to fall. Um, except when uh, RS1 is X1, X5, or X7, they are uh, usually the sequences in the in the code that is basically used to do something like uh, AUI PC, X7 offset, and then do a JLR X7. These kind of sequences are basically immutable because it is not relying on memory loads. So uh, they, they are exempted from uh, uh, requiring a landing bed on the target. Um, and the other thing that uh, architecture uh, poses is that uh, when you are landing on a target, uh, you must have a label setup, which which, uh, which will be set up on the call side and on the target, the label is embedded into the uh, LPAD instruction, which is proposed here. And if they don't match, uh, CPU is going to uh, raise a fault. Uh, we call it a software check exception and it is a new cause code. Uh, the, the spec is not ratified. It is still in development, uh, but this is the direction that it's going right now. Um, uh, ZICFI SS uh, extends the architecture with shadow stack. Um, uh, existing encoding of 010, which is reserved, uh, is used to mark the shadow stack. Um, shadow stack is, is a memory which we want to be uh, to to have uh, writes allowed for storing the return addresses, but nothing else. Uh, so regular stores are not allowed. Regular loads are allowed because you want to do things like backtrace. Uh, so you have an area using which you can do the backtrace reliably, knowing that there wasn't any corruption. Um, shadow stack memory accesses strictly operate on shadow stack memory. So if for some reason due to some uh, error in the program, uh, a shadow stack instruction executed on read-only read memory. Uh, uh, that will result into a store page fault. We'll get to that later. If uh, a shadow stack ha happened, uh, access happened on a read-write memory or a read-write execute memory or execute-only memory, that will raise an access fault because a program should not have any need to do that, and that indicates a fatality. Uh, and uh, the way, uh, if you can see this, you guys can see the the short uh, sequence of code that I've uh, written over there, right? So uh, when you compile the program, can you see that, or do you want me to zoom into it? What? Yeah. Oh. I mean, your slides are in a, I think it's in a I, the speaker I, view mode or something. Can you come here and check? I have to upload the PDF again. So. 
the PDF is there. Right. No, that PDF itself I'm seeing is in the speaker view mode or something, so it's not full screen. Because I see the same thing. I don't see a different one. Oh. Uh, okay. Better? Did I do? I see, I'm in the front, but who is in the back? Uh, you can see it. I can see it. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Uh, when you compile the program, compiler is going to generate this this kind of prolog. Uh, you have landing pad first, and then you have SS push x1. SS push is basically pushing your uh, the value which is in x1 onto the shadow stack, and your shadow stack is implicitly uh, uh, in a new CSR. It's called a CSR underscore SSP. So that's kind of a new general purpose register, you can say. Uh, when uh, in the epilogue, when you are uh, returning, uh, you load the return address in X5, and then you do SS pop check X5. Uh, what it, this instruction does is whatever is in the X5, it pops from the current uh, regular stack, and if they don't match, it's going to raise a softly check exception with the T well saying that it was a, a shadow stack uh, mismatch kind of a control flow integrity, integrity fault. If it uh, if they matches, then you can just do a JR X5. And that's how shadow stack work. Um, shadow stack and page fault. Um, so uh, if we go back to my one of the previous slide, uh, I said that shadow, shadow stack access raises a store fault on a read-only memory. And the reason for that uh, is that uh, um, when we do fork, uh, kernel has to make everything read-only, including your regular stack pages. And it does cow based on whenever a uh, write access is done on those pages. Um, the same kernel is not going to make an exception for shadow stack pages. Uh, so kernel will make them read only, which means that in PTs, they will be read only marking. Uh, but we still uh, want to allow the subsequent SS pop or SS push, SS pop check or SS push that are happening in the user mode. And in, in order for that to allow, uh, we want to get a page fault and not an access fault. And uh, that's the reason uh, read-only memory, whenever a page, uh, whenever a shadow stack access is happening, we raise a store page fault. And the reason for store page fault is that any shadow stack access in user mode means that at that point of time, we want to do a copy on write for that page. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this we have talked about. Uh, now coming to the runtime control flow changes and CFI. So these are the things that I could enumerate. If you have anything that I missed, please let me know. One is text patching. And within text patching, we have tracing, breakpoints, setup probes, and of course, eBPF. Um, eBPF, I didn't find anything which wouldn't work this uh, with this scheme of things. Uh, as long as whenever, whenever we are doing the JIT code gen, if BPF program if the code gen is updated to uh, emit the shadow stack sequences and landing pad sequences it should work uh, bpf program attaching to the k probes will work as soon, as long as we make sure that k probes are working um, is it still yeah um, so uh, tracing um, yes question here so you're, you're you're talking about uh, protecting the shadow shadow stack need be need to be protected, right? Because it is marked as uh, read only memory, right? right. Uh, otherwise, the security property doesn't make sense. Um, how does how does that you know? But but also it allows some special instruction to access to write to read shadow stack, right? Right. I'm wondering what is the uh, CPU state, right? Or additional bits are you are using in the page table entries to uh, uh, yeah. ensure that the CPU knows, okay, this is a shallow Yeah, so it's stack. the 010, RWX is equal to 010. Uh, so, so, so write bit is one, read bit is zero, execute bit is zero. It is, in risk five, that is currently a reserved encoding. So if you have that encoding, it's going to be uh, a fault anyways. When you implement this extension, then this encoding basically tells the CPU that this is a shadow stack page. Have you thought about anything about the, the virtualization? Is is going to be, is that hypervisor is going to be confused on this encodings? 
So uh, for second page table, this is anyways reserved today. Uh, but yes, if we want to protect supervise the shadow stack using uh, edge extension that might come in the future. And in that case, we can try to see what we can do for, you know, against aliasing attacks against shadow stack. But that's not part of this uh, spec yet. This is. Thanks. Um, where was I? Yes. Probing and, uh, 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 sorry, tracing support and CFI. Um, so a prologue with CFI would look like some, uh, something like this, in which uh, usually uh, when you when we enable ftrace, we have knobs inserted uh, at the call location. And those knobs are updated with the uh, AUIPC, uh, the register, and then we uh, do a JLR to that register, which is basically a, a trace handler. Um, with the CFI, the prologue will look something like uh, in which we have a landing pad inserted at the target, and then we have uh, the uh, AUIPC and JLR. Um, current proposal that we are do doing is that because landing pad is going to check the immutability of the, of the control flow, uh, the landing pad itself cannot be patched, but the knob subsequent to that can be patched. And uh, that's how we are rolling with it. Breakpoints and text patch. So whenever you are, we are going to put the breakpoints uh, at the start of the function, if we are patching LPAD, then that's going to uh, basically raise the fault. Let's say if you replace LPAD with eBreak, uh, eBreak is not a valid lightning point, and it's going to fault. So the proposal is that if you're using GDB and you're trying to patch the uh, target function using that, uh, make sure that uh, LPAD is never patched and the subsequent instruction is uh, patched in the uh, target location. Um, with this in place, I don't see any issues that k-probes won't work. I looked at the k-red probe as well. What k-red probe does is it installs a k-probe on the uh, function entry, and at that point of time, it makes sure that the pt reds RA is pointing to their red hook trampoline. The red hook trampoline gets called, and it caught the red probes, and eventually it does a JR2 array. And all of this should work uh, naturally with the uh, CFI LP and CFI SS. Okay, um, memory manager and shadow stack. So that's where um, we probably need some, uh, you know, eyeballs as well. Uh, so far, what I have looked is uh, on the user mode, we have protection read, protection write, and whenever uh, MMAP issues a protection write internally, what kernel does is it converts into a VMA of VMA read or with VM VM write. Um, my current implementation uses uh, creates a new protection flag called as prot shadow stack. And what we do is whenever prot shadow stacks come to the kernel, uh, what we do is for the VMA, we set just VM write and not VM read. And we are treating VM underscore write VMA flag as the shadow stack encoding. Other architectures have used VM arch underscore five, but they have their own quirks to that. We don't have any issues using VM underscore right. Uh, if you see any issues with that, yeah, let me know. Uh, other thing is that other architectures, because they are using VM arch bits, they can't make it work on 32 bit uh, because VM arch lives in the high VMA flags and VM, VM flags in the, in the structure is 32 bit on 32 bit architecture and 64 bit on uh, 64 bit architectures. Um, what, uh, yep. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, shadow stack is dedicated to store the return addresses, but uh, and uh, maybe it's not worth to expose the protection flag uh, prot underscore shadow stack to the user mode. Um, so right now the the direction I'm choosing is that uh, what x86 has already taken. Uh, they have created a new system call called as map underscore shadow stack, which implicitly assumes that this is going to map a shadow stack. So we don't need to expose this flag. And it kind of brings the some security properties as well that you can't arbitrarily manufacture shadow stacks uh, using MMAP uh, and protect. Um, user mode enabling. Um, there are two paths here. One is we... Uh, LD.SO starts the life uh, without shadow stack and landing pad. And that's the path x86 has chosen. But they have 
as far as I can tell, it looks like they have chosen that uh, path uh, uh, to clean up their own own mess. Um, I'm still investigating. Um, the other path is LD, LD.SO starts the life without shadow stack and landing pad. The only difference is uh, when you are starting life without shadow stack uh, and landing pad, then uh, loader has to go and check all the uh, objects in the address space. They have to check all the objects in the address space, and if all of them conform to the CFI, then it enables it using uh, some uh, PRCTLs. The other path is when LD.SO starts the life with shadow stack and landing pad. In that case, also, it has to check. But if it sees that any object is not conforming to the CFI, then it sends a PRCTL to disable CFI. Uh, this is still in progress, but the left is the chosen path right now. This is my last slide. Um, uh, glibc enabling um, so some applications may want to disable uh, cfi so they might we need an option in glibc using which we can disable it some applications may want cfi but they want some mechanism using which they can tell that if some of the other object files don't conform to cfi don't don't you know crash my application or don't uh, uh, still allow it to run so we call it permissive mode and then we can have a strict mode in which an application say can say using glibc enables that you know I, I want my application to run with uh, cfi properties and if any of the object file is not conforming to those properties just uh, uh, don't run it um, so we are following pretty much the uh, enables path that x86 has taken here um, and that's it questions <laughs> we only have five minutes. <laughs> so, how, how does long jump work? Like set jump, long jump? Um, so set jump, long jump will basically will have to save the. Uh, it, it's kind of a set uh, similar to set context and uh, uh, make context a a ABI. So in case of set jump, you are basically. Uh, you can push that address that that you want to go back to using uh, using shadow stack. So you'll have to update that in the set jump API. So there's like an SS save or something. Something like that. Yes. Okay. I mean that's how I have envisioned it right now, because there is no landing pad there, so you can't actually. Or or you can the other way is you, we can do is software guarded jump there, because we have a way to. But that is kind of a corruptible path because you don't have a place to store that right. So you have like when you did the set jump, and when you did the long jump in between, if that can be corrupted, that's a that's a window that you're giving an uh, attacker to. But if you're storing that somewhere on non-corruptible area like shadow stack, then you have a better way to reach that. I mean, there are there are a lot of more quirks, but I think 20 minutes is too less. So please talk to me if you want to talk to me yeah. about how we are going to safely switch the shadow stacks because we have a mechanism of you know token switching as well. I remember, um, I think there was an LWN article a while ago about CRIU and, um, and shadow stacks. Were those issues ever resolved? Uh, those issues uh, have been resolved in a way that CRIU has to do its own way, do its own stuff. The, the only problem with CRIU was that uh, x86 shadow stack does not, uh, by default, allow you to write to the shadow stack from user mode. Um, so there is a bit in some of the x86 MSRs. If you light that bit up, it allows you to write to the shadow stack. OK, but it doesn't affect us then, basically. It doesn't affect us because we are risk. So we right size everything and uh, rely on tool chains and compilers to do the right things. Uh, on slide nine, you're talking about KRET prob. And my use case is more in user space. So I have a tool that can do tracing of entry and exit of function by staying in user space without edit breakpoints. And shadow stack has been a pain for me on x86 already. And I'm wondering if this technique that you mentioned for Kbred Pro can be applied also in user space in some way. Or is there a restriction with the instruction? I don't know the instruction set of Rix5. So, yes. Uh, so in, in 
for your uh, your case, you will also install a red red pro similar to how red pro is installed on the kernel, right? Okay. Or so is it like in the middle of the function? Okay, so that will work also in your that case. that will work because the the major difference between shadow stack of RISC five and other architectures is that other architectures implicitly push the return address on yeah. the stack. Here we have a specific instruction. Yeah. Sorry.